Um, during this talk, whenever um, Professor Dennis is ready for questions or would like you guys to respond to anything um, he says, uh, please um, text either through chat or if he's okay with it, um, uh, you, you guys can unmute and just say it out loud. Um, either way is fine, uh, depending on what Professor Dennis would like. And yeah, um, Professor Dennis, thank you for joining us. Um, if you'd like to start presenting, you can. Sure, sure, I'll, I'll start presenting. So I understand that um, you are about to embark on a hackathon having to do with machine learning. And so what I'm gonna present is an overview of some work that we've been doing for several years. Um, and uh, there will be, uh, and I will provide the, um, the directors with a link to GitHub in case you wanna use this for your project now or later. Okay, so um, next slide, please, the motivation slide. So let's say that you're in a situation where you're a trader in finance and some, you know, your cousin calls and says, hey, I heard a hot tip from somebody, you know, buy X, Y, Z. Well, hopefully you won't just do it, okay? <laughs> because you're likely, the, you know, the, the buddy of your cousin, you know, probably doesn't know anything. So, you know, make a bad decision is a bad thing. In medical operation, there are lots of unnecessary prostate cancer uh, operations, for example. Terrible, terrible operations, and it's all because somebody's uh, Gleason score is too high, and it's just, it's not a very reliable, uh, sorry, somebody's Gleason score is fairly reliable, but somebody's uh, prostate-specific antigen is too high, it's a very bad reason to have a prostate operation. So. You don't want to be making bad decisions, and and you know that you could get a bad decision because the the source of the data is not reliable, or that you have some way of saying, "Hey, look, I don't have enough confidence to make a decision." So, um, medicine. Whoops, what, you, what happened? Sorry. Something just happened. Okay, medicine is what is called IID, which stands for Independent Identically Distributed which is to say that if a person comes in for prostate, that person looks like any other person who came in for prostate. It doesn't change so much over time or anything. Uh, so independent, identically distributed means, you know, if, if they have, let's say, a high score on some test, uh, in a prostate test, uh, probably the outcome is gonna be pretty similar to anybody else with that score. I mean, at least in, as far as averages is concerned, if we could do really uh, tailored medicine, then it would be different. But, but the point is it doesn't change over time. If let's say, you know, somebody who's this age and has this score should be treated in some way, that's gonna be true now and it's gonna be true in 10 years. Okay, finance though, and other things are not, uh, are not like this. And this talk is gonna deal with both, both the IID case and the finance case where, or, or anyway, time series sort of cases where causal factors can change. And just to see um, the, uh, an example, please go to the next slide. Oh, incidentally, um, by all means, if you have something to say, you can just, um, just for now, just speak up. If that becomes too distracting, then we'll use the chat box, but for now, speaking up is completely fine. Um, it's only 20 slides, you're already, oh, Apparently, twenty-nine slides. So you're not that far away. It's not. It's not good. It's not a too long a lecture. In fact, there'll be time at the end also for discussion. So this notion that things could change over time, that that the input-output re relationship in a machine learning uh, setting could change over time, is called concept drift. And um, just to give you a very concrete example, uh, let's take a recommender system. The recommender system will, let's say, recommend products or movies. Well, let's say I go to a recommender system site and it says, well, you know, I think the movie you should see is Casablanca. Now, it is a great movie. It is true. But it's probably not, you know, the kind of movie you're going to see that just came out. So recommender systems, by their very nature, are going to have concept drift. Because the, if, I, if I give the profile of some person, you know, a, a teenage, uh, teenager from California, you know, that person's, uh, if I give that profile, and even 
if I know the movies that he or she liked, the movie that I'm going to suggest could be quite different over time. So this is a notion of concept drift, that is the, the mapping from the input through the machine learning system to the recommendation in this case would change over time, depending on the data. And that's also true, of course, of finance. Similarly, epidemics, uh, this talk was given in November, we didn't really have this current ep epidemic, but epidemic spreads can also change over time, of course. Um, next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about several things that we can do to, to adapt to concept drift. The first thing is that we're gonna use machine learning methods themselves that adapt over time. And, uh, and then we're going to do some other tricks. So let's do them one at a time. Machine learning methods that adapt over time. Next slide, please. So you've all heard uh, perhaps of neural nets and neural nets ha use a, a method of updating the net network uh, called stochastic gradient descent. And basically what stochastic gradient descent is a feedback mechanism. Okay, if, you have, if you've never appreciated feedback, let me give you a thought experiment. Take a 1990 car, uh, take the most intelligent person that you know, maybe yourself, whoever, blindfold that person and say, okay, I gave you a map yesterday, um, now drive blindfolded. Okay, or you take a pretty not intelligent person and you let them use their eyes. Who's in which car would you like to be? Okay, this is the power of feedback. Okay, even though maybe the not so intelligent person is not so intelligent, the feedback is an enormous advantage. And neural networks similarly use feedback. So their gradient descent method, what it does is each prediction is compared with the output with the correct answer and then that is fed back into the network, changes the weights a little bit, sometimes in mysterious ways, and hopefully there'll be fewer errors with inputs like that. So if you've been distinguishing between cats and dogs, and somebody comes in with a wolf and says, you have to make this a different category, um, eventually the neural network will adapt to that. So that means that it's good for concept drift, because if, for example, um, you're doing the recommender system for movies, it will now say, oh, okay, uh, that other movie that we suggested wasn't good, this is a better movie. And that will then be reflected in, in the neural network through stochastic gradient descent. Okay, let me just take a, a quick stop here. Um, let me just ask whether you're hearing the audio well, whether all of that is fine. Am I yeah. talking to you? Yeah, the audio is good. Talking at the right pace, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, random forests is, a, are, is another machine learning technique, and it is a bunch of decision trees. And a decision tree is something very simple, like a decision tree would be something like if it's raining uh, uh, really hard and when there's wind, sorry, if it's raining, yes. If there's wind, yes, take a raincoat. No, if it's not windy, then take an umbrella. That would be a decision tree. Okay, so it really is a tree, and you just go down the tree. And a random forest is just a bunch of decision trees. It has some special properties, but that's really what it is. And this can also be made adaptive, um, because even though normally it's for this IID data, which is independent of time, it can be made adaptive by the following simple idea, that if a tree is often wrong, rebuild it based on the re recent data. So discard trees that are, that are doing bad. So almost every machine learning algorithm by itself can be made adaptive. Next slide, please. So the next thing that we're gonna look at is what are called multi-armed bandit style algorithms. So bandit doesn't mean you're uh, going to rob somebody Bandit has to do with um, slot machines, actually, and the multi-armed or multi-armed slot machines. Okay, even that relationship is not so direct, so let me explain. Next slide, please. 
So the basic idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of machine learning algorithms and we're going to adjust the weights over time depending on how accurate they, they have been. So maybe each one is adaptive on its own, but it might be that the random forest is doing consistently worse than the neural network or vice versa, in which case what we'll do is we'll ad adapt the weights so that the one that's doing better gets more weight. That's the entire idea. And that can also, of course, be adaptive over time and change over time, and therefore that can also handle concept drift. And it can also just handle the training uh, stage of any situation, even when the data is not drifting, even when it's IID. Okay, so that's the next thing. All right, so all of that stuff uh, uh, was invented by other very smart people. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've done, and we call it Save Predict. And the basic idea here is that we're going to refuse to predict sometime. Remember the example I started with where the buddy of your cousin said, you know, buy the stock? You know, that probably you want to refuse. <laughs> so so um, uh, let's see how this works. Go to the next slide, please. So just to give you a little spoiler, um, what we've done is we've taken several uh, machine learning benchmarks here. Um, uh, for example, MNIST, the first one, you can see it on the right, um, is uh, a handwriting recognition. Cover has to do with coverage of, uh, of the earth, whether it's forest or not forest. A Connect4 is the Connect4 game. Uh, COD RNA is a coding, trying to figure out what are coding sequences in the DNA, things like that. So, so the way you read this is as follows. Um, if, we, um, if we don't ever refuse, then we have a refusal rate, which you see on the bottom left. And you can see that for some of the data sets, the error rate is higher, for some of them it's lower. If we refuse, um, uh, if, if, we, if we say, I want an error rate that's going to be half of the natural error rate. So uh, in the case of, um, sorry, my, my screen on the bottom is, has something blocking it. Okay, so you notice that, for example, uh, on the bottom set of charts, the little, the blue in the epsilon over two is half the height of the blue to the left of it. The green is half the height of the, green on the left of it, and so on and so forth, they're all about half the height, then what will happen is we, we can get that on the non-refused predictions. In other words, we're going to refuse sometimes, but for the non-refused ones, we're going to get a lower error rate, which means, of course, we can't just refuse randomly. We're not going to just toss a coin and say when to refuse. We have to be a little bit intelligent about when we refuse, but we can do it in such a way that we can reduce the error on the ones that are not refused. So just to recap, our goal is to refuse sometimes so that when we don't refuse, we get a lower error rate. This is a good time for questions if anybody has a question. Okay, if not, next slide, please. So our basic idea is what's called a conformal prediction. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a data set and we're going to say, hey, were we ever really quite successful with a data point like this one? If we were successful with a data point like this one, and this is a new data point, then we're going to predict for them, for this one. That's the basic idea. So if you can imagine that you're a doctor, a medical doctor, and somebody comes in and you've seen thousands of people with the common flu, Excuse me. Uh, Karen, could you get that, sweetie? All right, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, so you've seen thousands of people with the common flu. And so you say, hey, look, this is the common flu. You know, drink a lot of juice, uh, take some aspirin, call me in the morning kind of thing. On the other hand, if you see somebody and they're presenting symptoms you've never seen, 
um, you know, which could be scary, which I won't go into because it's about lunchtime here. Um, you know, you, you, you're not going to just say, hey, I know what to do with this patient. So conformal prediction is that same idea. Yeah, it's the idea that if I've been successful with similar, similar data points, then I'm going to uh, be willing to predict and not refuse to predict. Next slide, please. And the basic idea, the basic way that this works, and as I said, the software that we, uh, that I, I can send a link for um, does this, is it, um, there, as in normal machine learning, there's a training set and a test set, but here the training set is divided into a core and a calibration set. And so the core is used for training, just as usual. But then um, the core, uh, the, the, sorry, machine learning algorithm will normally give some kind of confidence score, which is not the same as a probability, it's just a score. And what we want to do is we want to make, convert that score into a probability of error. So in the case of a random forest, for example, where there are a lot of decision trees, what we might say is, we're going to trust the outcome of this random forest. Let's say it says the person is sick or the person is not sick. We're going to trust that if 70% of the trees agree. But we don't know a priori that 70% is the right number. So we're going to have to calibrate to find that out. And so the calibration set is just used to say, OK, the, the random forest or whatever, the, whichever machine le learning method I'm using gives me a score. I'm going to use that score to decide whether to accept or not accept. So that's the whole idea of conformal prediction. It's a very simple idea, but very powerful. Because what it means is that, at least for IID data, we can do this calibration once and for all. And then, given the score of a machine learning algorithm, we can say, OK, I'm going to accept that prediction or not. If I refuse to accept it, I just won't act on it. Um, and if I, and, but if I accept it, then I can probably get a pretty good error rate, whatever error rate I was aiming for. Any questions at this point? OK, next slide, please. But what happens if things are not independent, identically distributed? Again, just to recap, because some people came in late, what this means is identically, uh, independent, identically distributed, or IID, what it means is that there's no concept drift. What was true 50 years ago is still true today. Okay? And so, um, and so if there's no concept drift, then I can do this calibration once and for all. I don't even have to make my machine learning algorithms adapt. You know, I'm just pretty much set. But what if things are not like that? What if things are drifting, like recommender systems, or like finance, or like the, uh, the progress of a pandemic? Um, so here, what we're going to do, what Safe Predict does, is it does an additional layer. And what it does is it looks at the non-refused outputs. In other words, conformal prediction, the thing that I just discussed, says, oh, I'd like to make a prediction here. And those are called non-refused outputs. But then it, you know, say predicts, does one more check and it says, you know, how has this conformal prediction thing been working for me lately? If it's not been working too well, then I'm gonna still refuse even if conformal prediction accepts. So, um, so what could happen is that uh, so that's the intuition. There's a bunch of math behind it, but that's completely the intuition. So in other words, I not only say, what did conformal prediction say? What did, what did not conformal prediction say for me? And whether sh should I refuse this prediction or not, refuse to accept the prediction or not? Uh, now it's a, an additional check to say, if conformal prediction hasn't been doing too well, then maybe I should refuse anyway. So an analogy would be, you have some advisor, you're an extremely important person, and uh, you, know, you have some advisor, and that advisor was giving you good advice for many years. All of a sudden, something new happens, and I don't know, maybe that person had a bad thing happen in their life or whatever, and now their advice is really bad. So even though that advisor, which is like the output of conformal prediction, told you something, you're gonna still refuse. 
and that's um, and that's what we do. But the trouble is, if you now always refuse from that advisor or from conformal prediction, then you know, you're never going to make any predictions. That's not good either. You're going to refuse all the time. So what we do is what is periodically we accept. We accept the prediction and we act on it. And then if the, accept, if the predictions get better and better, then we say, okay, you know, maybe that person's back on their game or maybe conformal prediction is doing its thing. Possibly conformal prediction is doing its thing better because the underlying machine learning algorithms have adapted. So that's the, that's the entire intuition of this safe predict. Next slide, please. So I'm not sure this is a helpful slide, but here it is. Some people like to look at uh, pictures like this. So conformal prediction is a CBR thing. And safe predict uh, is after that. So if conformal prediction rejects, then safe predict doesn't even see it. But if conformal prediction accepts, meaning, yes, uh, I'll act on that prediction, safe predict makes the final decision whether to act on the prediction or not. That's the idea. Next slide, please. So now, just some experiments to show you what's going on with this. Um, Next slide, please. So again, these are classic data uh, mining, machine learning algorithms. Uh, I mean, sorry, data sets. And here's what they're defined as. Um, so there were a whole, and a whole bunch of different things from game playing to ecology. Next slide, please. So in this experiment, we take a base classifier, which is a random forest with 100 decision trees. Um, and it gives some kind of um, score. Um, and then what we do is, is we train the random forest over 25% of the data, test on the remaining 25%. But we're, if, under the IID assumption, which these data sets happen to support, uh, we're going to actually have a core, which is 50% of the data. We're going to actually build a random forest on that. Then we're going to calibrate, as I said, on 25%, and then we're going to test on the remaining 25%. And so um, if we do that, then what we'll say is, as I mentioned before, we might say something like, I'll only accept a classification if, say, over 70% or over you know, 68% or some number of the trees agree. Next slide, please. And this is the slide I showed you earlier, where if, you, if we do just that simple idea, we can reduce the error rates on the accepted predictions uh, and would not, without refusing too much. So I didn't really go over the top uh, um, set of histograms. Top set of histograms are how often do we refuse to predict? But obviously, if we always refuse, that's useless. So we don't want to refuse too often. If we want our error rate to be uh, half of the uh, error rate, if we never refused, then you, know, you can see how much we refused there. It's a little bit hard to see, I agree, but it's something like 30% at the worst. But if we want our error rate to be a quarter of what it was without any refusal, then of course the refusal rate goes up, but still sometimes it might be tolerable. So you know, it's really a question of risk reward. You know, uh, you know there, there could be opportunities that you lose, but on the other hand, when you take the opportunities, you get better results. That's the, that's the essential idea. Next slide, please. Now, what about concept drift? So here what we did was we looked at um, things having to do, we, had to, we looked at uh, electricity price change. So this is a, a kind of financial application where uh, prices go up and down and you, know, you want to figure this out. But of course, it's not at all IID. It changes all the time with time. And but we get a similar result. We can, we can have a fewer um, errors and uh, our efficiency goes down, but it, uh, efficiency meaning number of predictions we can make goes down, but it not, doesn't go down too much. Next slide, please. So 
um, if we look at this, we see that concept drift is an issue in finance, but in many other applications. This talk came from a talk to uh, bond traders mostly. Uh, and that's why I'm, I, I talk about finance. I do live in New York City too, which has one or two financial institutions. So it's another reason. Um, but anyway, um, so it's an issue in finance, but it's an issue in a lot of, lot of areas where like the movie recommender area too. Uh, machine learning algorithms can be made to be adaptive. Uh, neural nets by nature, random forest by construction. You take away the worst tree. Multi-armed bandits and adjusting the weights, usually using something called logistic regression, can be used to improve the performance if you have many machine learning algorithms and you want to get a better output. Conformal prediction would be applied directly to the machine learning algorithm. So the way this would work is you'd have the machine learning algorithm, the conformal prediction, the thing with the calibration, that feeds into the multi-armed bandit, uh, and then the output of the multi-armed bandit goes to say predict. And say predict just says, look, based on the predictions that were allowed from the multi-armed bandit, if it hasn't been doing too well, just refuse the prediction anyway. So there's a lot more work to do. Uh, this is something that we're actively working on um, with financial and other data. But it's, um, it's something that you might find useful depending on the kinds of machine learning problem that you're faced with. So that's actually the entire talk. Um, I had a more technical talk, but I decided to spare you because I think it'd be better if people ask questions. And I will also share uh, the link. Oh yeah, you can certainly have the PDF. That's perfectly fine. It can be sent to everybody. Uh, so that, that, I'm just answering one of the chats. Okay, and then I'm going to just put in the, um, I'm gonna put in the, the link in the chat box. Go ahead, if there are questions, please go ahead. Please. Oh yeah, you can ask your questions by either unmuting yourself or writing in the chat. You know, I think unmuting is better. Uh, yeah, so I had one question. So, um, so safe predict, it basically uses prediction, right? To um, uh, so, how is that better than uh, other machine learning algorithms that you know, like test um, that have like test cases and that um, actually like test the data rather than just pr predicting it? No, no. So, say predict is not a machine learning algorithm. Okay. That sits here. If you go back, go back a little bit, please. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. A little bit more. There, that, there, there, stop. Go, go, go. Go, to, go to the next slide. Okay. okay, so P here is the prediction algorithm. Okay. It doesn't do it. I mean, there is a, an enormous community of people who invent new machine learning algorithms. So we didn't want to do that. <laughs> like, we didn't want to, we didn't want to do that. We don't, didn't want to be one more voice in the crowd. So. So there are, there, are, there are fantastic people who do this. I mean, some of my colleagues, uh, one of my colleagues uh, is named Jan LeCun. He won the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize of um, computer science for neural nets, he and somebody else. So, you know, this is, they're really good people. And, you know, I, I neither have the, maybe the, not the talent nor the inclination to try to compete in that field. It's just, it's just too hot. Um, but, so what, are, what is Safe Predict doing? Safe Predict is doing everything to the right of P, P being the predictor. It's first saying, okay, we're gonna use this conformal prediction, which we didn't invent, but we've incorporated into Safe Predict. And the conformal prediction says, when do I accept the prediction? It doesn't say how to predict, it just says, when do I accept the prediction? And I'm gonna do that based on a confidence measure of P. And then, the stuff that we really did invent was the next step, which is if conformal prediction says accept, meaning yes, I'll, I'll act on that prediction. There's one more filter, it's called safe predict, which says, you know what, maybe not, maybe we're not gonna accept because you know conformal prediction and P and CBR together, you've not been doing so well for me lately. So I'm gonna reject. 
But then Saint Benedict is, you know, kind of um, like a an indulgent parent, and periodically, you know, the child has been bad and bad and bad. But you know, the indulgent parent is going to say, okay, but still, you know, you're basically a good kid, so we're still going to go out for ice cream. And so periodically, Saint Benedict will say, okay, we're going to accept anyway. But the, the goal is to do that not too often and not too seldom. Not too often, because if you do it too often, then the error rate will go up. And if you do it too seldom, then you'll always refuse. Okay, so you want to be between the indulgent parent and the always say no parent. Uh, I had a question on this slide. So when would CVR like reject based on like, how would the reliability score have to be for CVR to reject it? So, so that we can't answer, you know, I can't answer that a priori. What we're going to have to do is depend on the calibration. So if you go, I'm not sure whether it's forward or backwards. Anyway, there was this notion that um, we develop a model on 50% of the data set. Then we calibrate on 25% of the data. So let's say that I want to have an error rate no bigger than 10%. So then what I'll do, and let's say I'm using random forests, I'm just being very concrete. So, so what I'll do is I'll, in the calibration set, I'll say what fraction of the trees must agree for me to get no more than 10% error. Okay, I mean, sometimes, you know, I'll get 90% agreeing and I'll still get an error, but if that doesn't happen too often, then, you know, that might be a good threshold or maybe 80% is a good threshold. So we don't know a priori before we start looking at the data what this is gonna be. But once we do this calibration, then we can know. But we can only know if the data is not really changing, if it's IID. If it's IID, then CBR works beautifully, and you know that's what we recommend. Uh, but in that case, what will happen is uh, CBR will accept whenever that threshold is met, and when it accepts, most of the time that'll be correct. So safe predict will say, "Fine, anytime you know, I just trust you. Anytime you say it's good, it's good." Yeah. That answer my question. Thank you. So I think I sent to Pranav, I sent you the link in case anybody's interested in using this. So Professor, I just wanted to clarify something really quickly. So um, in terms of safe predict, um, is this um, next, this, is this following statement correct? So as the error rate of the model decreases, um, safe, predict, safe predict will allow for more predictions. Is that correct? Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Oh, that's exactly right. That makes sense. Right. I mean, it really, it really should accord with your intuition about a person giving you advice, right? If, if they've been right in the past and they like nothing particularly has happened, you're going to continue to trust them, right? And by the way, you know, because I'm much older than all of you, um, this is an important thing. Okay, your credibility is maybe the most important thing in your career. You know, if you think that, uh, and I'm sure none of you are like this, but uh, if you meet people who try to speak with big terms or wave their hands a lot or, and, and they lose credibility, nobody will listen to them again, ever, at least in any technical field. In politics, it's something else. <laughs> in a technical field, it's not like that. <laughs> so, um, so just please note that your, your credibility is like the most important thing. And, and saying you don't know is fine. I often don't know. I, I, I write um, puzzles, a lot of puzzles. Um, right now for, I used to write for Scientific American. Now I write for something called CACM, which is ACM is the computer organization. And, um, and what happens, so I, write, I invent puzzles. There are also some in TED-Ed.com, in case you like puzzles. Anyway, I'm much better at inventing puzzles than in solving them. So when my books were translated to Japanese, for example, there were three translators, one for the first half of the book, one for the second half of the book, and one to find better solutions than mine. And I was like super psyched. I love this idea that they found better solutions. So you, you know, it's fine to say you don't know. 
I mean, eventually you want to know. But it's fine to say you don't know, but it's really not fine to pretend you know. Okay, sorry, a little life advice. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, it's been a pleasure. And um, I wish you luck with your hackathon. Yeah, thank and, you, uh, Professor. Yeah, thank you for joining us today and um, giving this talk. I think everyone was able to obtain a better understanding of safe, safe predict and how exactly it works. So thank you for that. You're most welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. Sweet and thank you all for attending. Um, thank you for yeah. attending. Bye. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right, guys, so that concludes this webinar. I put off, can you post the presentation? Yeah, yeah, let me do that. All right, so if you guys want the presentation that uh, he just went over, um, oh, wait, no, wrong one. Okay, I will send you guys a link later, because I need to, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll send you guys the PDF later. Um, and if you guys are looking for the actual um, the video of uh, yeah. Professor Dennis's talk, we will post it after this week on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I just sent the GitHub with which you guys can uh, use this code um, in your projects. Uh, and this code basically does what he's talking about, um, what, what he was talking about in his presentation. So if you guys are interested in that, then you can use that GitHub link. Okay, so later today at 11 o'clock, we have a workshop held by Echo AR, where they will go over creating AR, VR um, apps in, like, in 15 minutes. So it's just like a hands-on way uh, to learn more about how to use AR, VR. Yep, and I'm pretty sure um People don't need coding experience for this one, right? Yeah. yeah, so even if you don't have any coding experience, I would still recommend that you attend it. Yeah, um, they're gonna teach yeah. you the AR and VR projects with or without coding experience. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's it. So thank you guys for attending. Uh, we'll put uh, the enough, I have a question. Oh, okay, yeah. No, it's actually not a question. I can actually attend the 11 o'clock uh, seminar which is conducting because I actually live in India and oh, okay. it's going to be around 1130 for us okay. so is there uh, could you guys record that and post it on your YouTube and send your uh, send the video in slack for something for that yeah so I think it's going to be recorded uh, this is the only webinar that we are not hosting Echo AR is hosting it themselves so um, we will try to make sure it's recorded yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no. So does anyone have any more questions? On the hackathon on and on anything? Okay. Okay, so I think that's it. All right.